So my topic was kinematic alignment is all that matters. And my disclosures for some reason have not come up. Uh, so I have a consultancy with Zimmer and uh, Medacta and just so that you know that. What is kinematic alignment? Kinematic alignment restores the sagittal and coronal alignment of the native knee and limb. Here's a patient with a typical varus alignment. This is what the limb and knee should look like postoperatively. The distal lateral femoral angle, proximal medial tibial angle, should equal that of the native side when it's normal. In the sagittal projection, the same holds true. Flexion of the femoral component should match that of the native side, as should the slope of the tibial component. How is kinematic alignment performed? We use 10 serial caliper measurements within a half millimeter to set the components coincident to the natal joint lines of the knee. Four caliper measurements set the femoral component to the joint lines. And here you can see the distal and posterior cuts, sagittal view from the lateral and medial condyle, and the resection should equal the thickness of the condyles of the implant that you use after you correct for the kerf and the wear of the cartilage. Two caliper measurements set the varus valgus of the tibial component coincident to the native joint line. Once again, we measure the resection on the medial and lateral tibial plateau at the base of the spine where there's generally not any wear and strive to make it equal. That prevents the risk of too much varus or valgus. Two caliper measurements, and you're familiar with this, sets the patella component coincident to the native joint line of the knee. And so we all do this, or we have. We measure the thickness of the patella, we adjust the thickness of the resection, so when the implant's in, we've restored the native position. Finally, there's two caliper measurements that sets the slope of the tibial component coincident to the native joint line. We make a measurement of the anterior offset of the tibia with respect to the femur at 90 degrees of flexion with the exposure of the knee, as you see here. And then we adjust the slope until that offset is restored after we correct for the wear on the cartilage on the medial side uh, with the components in place. That helps fine tune and set the tension of the posterior cruciate ligament, which we prefer to retain. There's more accurate alignment to target, that is the native alignment with calipered kinematic alignment than with robotic or navigated mechanical alignment. It's a paper that we just had published in JOA where we looked at the symmetry of the correction compared to the native side in a series of knees. At the top on the right, you can see the limb alignment is within 95% of the time within three degrees of native. The distal lateral femoral angle, 97% within three degrees of native. And more importantly, the proximal medial tibial angle is within three degrees of native. So it's at 97% of the time. So we don't make this error of too much varus cut we restore what the patient has preoperatively. There's better patient function and satisfaction and deflection after kinematic alignment than mechanical alignment according to three meta-analyses from different parts of the world. University of Pennsylvania stated that functional outcome as measured by knee society score favored kinematic alignment over mechanical alignment. An article from China said that kinematic alignment provided function and a better uh, flexion and function than mechanical alignment. And an article from Korea said that kinematic alignment oriented the joint line more parallel to the floor, similar to the native knee, although the limb and knee alignment were the same as mechanical alignment. So it's just a tilt in the joint line. Now what's surprising from this is there's actually negligible varus tibial loosening after kinematic alignment, which is less than that's been reported for mechanical alignment. We published a paper in 2017. We had 2,725 knees with a range of follow-up two to nine years, and we had a 0.3% failure of the component presented relatively early at an average of 28 months. There was no varus loosening in these patients. The, in, the loosening problem was posterior subsidence or insert wear, which was due to a surgeon error where the posterior slope was on average five degrees more than it should have been compared to the native side. So if you match the slope, you decrease the risk of this posterior subsidence and loosening and can manage the risk of tibial loosening and kinematic alignment. Kinematic alignment, surprisingly, without ligament release, restores native tibial compartment forces that are several times lower than the mechanical alignment forces. So we measured tibial compartment forces in 63 subjects treated with calipered kinematic alignment. And here you can see how we took the photographs in the operating room and looking at the flexion angle of the knee and the forces. 
And we published this in the Bone and Joint Journal, looking at the relationship of these forces to alignment. We found no evidence of tibial compartment overload and comparable forces in patients with varus and valgus outlier and, and in-range alignment. So we didn't see medial overload in the so-called varus knee. If we look at the in vivo compartment forces of our knees versus to the native knee, we can take the data from Vera Strait's article just published this year in Journal Biomechanics. On the x-axis, we have medial force, lateral force indifference, y-axis tibial compartment, and here is the calipered kinematic alignment forces, and this is what the native knee has, almost identically the same. Now, if we look at mechanical alignment forces from Mangini's article, where three surgeons did either measured resection or gap balancing with navigation checked, and we look at the same plots, there's the native for, or the native or kinematic aligned forces. That's the force in measured resection in the medial compartment on average. That's the force in the lateral and the difference. If we look at the gap balancing technique, also very high. Mechanical alignment was four to three times higher after ligament release than kinematic alignment was without ligament release in the medial compartment, six to five times higher in the lateral compartment, and the differences were three to two times higher. So what can patients do after kinematic alignment? Well, I'm afraid they're gonna do anything they want. So this happens to be the patient's x-rays I showed at the start of the talk. This happens to be the alignment. Once again, the goal is to match the opposite side. And this is what the guy does, 630 miles, 63 years of age, and he can do five and 10K races on his artificial knee on the left. So to summarize, when science decides, perhaps kinematic alignment may be all that matters. 10 caliper measurements performed in sequence can accurately restore the sagittal and coronal alignment of the native knee and limb within a half millimeter degree in 95% of our patients. KA independently in meta-analyses has been shown looking at randomized trials not done by me, provide better clinical outcomes, negligible and lower risk of tibial loosening, and more normal and lower compartment forces than mechanical alignment, hence posing a better risk of long-term survivorship. If this has intrigued you, perhaps you might strive to make your patients happy and give kinematic alignment a try. Thank you very much.